Okay, colleagues, uh, let's start. I, am, I have a duty to lead this session. Uh, really, am I honored uh, to, uh, to lead such such very very important session. Uh, I I would like to take uh, to have opportunity to say uh, that I have great pleasure to welcome Sune Swarberg to open this session with his presentation. Uh, uh, the to uh, topic is very actual and it's written on, on the, uh, our agenda. I should say and would, would like to remind a few words about history. Uh, you know, there was an event, a worldwide known event, uh, collapse of Iron Curtain. As they, up the next, in the next day, when Iron Curtain collapsed, uh, we exchanged m messages and letters with Sune find out that we have joint uh, publications, not co-authored, but similar ones. And from this point, we started really, uh, if speaking in optical terminology, we get very optical coherence, working together in various ways, on both ways, uh, Sona coming to Riga and uh, delegating some funds to us when we had very very, very exhausted with financing. And of course, we have a single resource, our human resources, and very soon, uh, all this and Janis were in, in, in Lund, and few other colleagues benefited from visits in Lund. And still up to now, we have very strong cooperation. We are very thankful to Sune about this great job, leading the council from RHA project. And of course, I hope you will also in some way help us to guide our Council for School platform of Photonic LV. Okay, Sune, you are welcome to start your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Arnold. It's really a great pleasure for me to be part of this adventure. Um, nice to see you all out there. Um, I will, in uh, this talk, uh, be uh, discussing uh, applications of uh, laser spectroscopy. Um, my background is in uh, pure atomic physics and uh, spectroscopy, laser spectroscopy of various kinds. And um, in these fields, uh, we had a lot of collaboration with the scientists from Riga. But say during the last, well, for quite some time now, some decades actually, I also pursued uh, applied laser spectroscopy, uh, realizing that, uh, of course, our advanced technologies mostly developed for basic science uh, are also excellent tools for uh, advanced uh, applications. So I am having this talk, uh, the pleasure to discuss some environmental, ecological and agricultural aspects of these things. And in a later talk, uh, Professor Katharina Swanberg will talk about laser spectroscopy applied to uh, medicine. So that will be a, a survey of uh, what can be done in certain areas. I have a double affiliation since uh, very many years, uh, Lund University. I'm the founding director of the Lund Laser Center which is also part of a laser lab in Europe. We may have heard about that before. So we are located here in the southern part. And uh, of course, in this uh, um, uh, uh, organization of uh, large facilities, we also have the laser center of the uh, University of Latvia. Okay, we are close to Malmö and we have the bridge over to Copenhagen, which is really our international airport. <laughs> Once we can start to use airports again, we, one way or the other, sort of forgot how to do this. We hope we can catch up again. Anyway, Lund University is the home of the Lund Laser Center, but also and more prominently, I have to admit uh, the Max 4 synchrotron radiation facility, which is a real uh, gem, a real nice thing. And we also have the uh, European Spallation source being very close to completion. It's a huge project about uh, neutron physics. 
But um, in Sweden, we have uh, retirement uh, requirements, of course, uh, which is a very good idea, uh, generally speaking. Uh, we then had the opportunity to uh, both Katharina and me to um, uh, be a part of a new project in uh, the third largest city of China, Guangzhou, down in the very south. Very nice climate, uh, which was part of the story, I guess. Um, and um, we have actually been there for uh, about 10 years now, part time, uh, while still having uh, certain fractions of uh, uh, on payroll also from Lund University. So this is the group um, of young people there. And uh, it's a bit challenging, of course, with language and all these things, but uh, it's been quite interesting and we're pursuing applied laser spectroscopy, mostly environment and medicine. Uh, you can see here also a photo I took from the intercampus bus passing the Pearl River, the Chujiang. They have very poetic names on everything over there. So it's a huge city with uh, 15 million people and or so. Okay, uh, the group we are running over in, the, in, in China jointly um, has uh, quite a few of applications and this mimics pretty much the way um, we have been working with uh, applied laser spectroscopy at the Lund Laser Center and, and still are actually. And you can see here from the left we come uh, through the environmental areas, through ecology, agriculture, food safety and biomedicine. And of course it seems to be a huge area and you can say how can you talk or grab this in one group. Well, you know, from a physicist or a spectroscopist point of view, it's very easy because the simple answer is we do exactly the same thing in all these areas. It's just a question of the scale. Here we have big optics, half a meter telescopes, and over here we have fiber optics, but lasers, of course, different size, spectrometers, whatever, thinking, computing, um, multivariate analysis, it's all the same, multispectral imaging. And uh, there is a lot of cross fertilization between these areas indeed. So in my talk, I will cover these areas here from environment over say to food safety. And um, uh, just after lunch, uh, Professor Katharina Svanberg will cover more the biomedical aspects in uh, of these things. So again, <laughs> how are these areas related? You know, does it make sense to deal with these things? And it makes sense from the point of view of the cross fertilization possible. And this is just one example. How is the environmental monitoring and the medical aspects related the way we do it? Well, we can think about monitoring gases in the environment we send a laser beam across the city, might be Riga, against a retroreflector, and light is coming back to the detector. And by tuning the laser, we get the average concentration of the gas pollutants uh, over the city over here. Or we take uh, laser radiation, transmit it through the skull bone on a patient. Well, this guy here has seen it's actually me. It's an MRI image of my skull. So this is what I looks inside. Um, so, you know, what happens then is that light passes through the small slit of air in the sinus cavity, scatters off the brain. Few photons again come back, passes the air um, slit and uh, the skull bone goes into the detector. Very little light should come out, yes? For sure, very little light comes out, but it is possible to see it. And of course, then we measure the average concentration of oxygen inside the sinus cavity, exactly in the same way as we do it uh, for the environmental monitor. Or as you can see up here, this is the gate of the Lund Cathedral, 1000 years old. And here we have been standing with a laser radar bus uh, system firing ultraviolet laser beams, scanning row by row and inducing fluorescence, laser induced fluorescence. 
analyzing the spectral print here, doing multivariate analysis, we show areas, um, you know, with invisible structures, actually it's uh, very thin layers of algae, different types of stones from different quarries, quarries and, and so on. And we can uh, really map that out. Or we instead take a laser beam. Now it might be four by four centimeters instead of eight by eight meters. And we illuminate this area with ultraviolet light do some processing of the fluorescence and show the pixels which fulfill a cancer criterion. We image the cancer uh, by fluorescence. And of course, there is no difference between these projects. We do exactly the same. It's just the scale which is different. So this is sort of a good news in terms of the general area of the teaching spectroscopy and so on. You have a toolbox and uh, you put up your shop tools and do a lot of things in different areas. That's what I try to teach the students. Well, air pollution, a bad problem uh, almost everywhere in the world. Uh, this happens uh, to be a slide I got from uh, my friend Frank Tittel in at Rice University. This is Houston and it looks pretty nice here, but of course, on certain days it looks like this, and uh, this could be a pretty common scene in, in China, although things are, are improving there. And we all have our share of this, of course. And it's important to be able to know what's going on. And uh, by laser beams, it's possible to map out basically in three dimensions how the pollutants are distributed. And that can be done with a mobile uh, laser radar system. We heard about the uh, satellite ranging before. This is basically the same thing. But we do this here in a spectroscopic way. We have a tunable laser. We can tune the radiation to the absorption of a certain pollutant. And we can take a reference wavelength close by. And based on that, by differential absorption, we can put on our magic glasses and see the world in a particular pollutant. Now that's an example of that you see below here. This is from um, uh, Lorenzo Pavias, this beautiful country. This happens to be uh, Rosignano Solvay, south of Livorno, a chloralkali plant, where there are lots of uh, liquid mercury cells, electrolytic cells, and we fire the beam here downwind from this plant, scan it, and encounter the invisible plume of atomic mercury, very low concentrations, as you can see here. Uh, that's done by such a system. We transmit from the roof and uh, all under computer control. This is another example also from my favorite country, not to talk about Latvia, of course. <laughs> um, this is Italy, and this is uh, the uh, Europe's largest volcano at uh, Etna in uh, Sicily. It, it happens to be have eruptions right now, actually. But this is on, a, on occasion when it was not erupting. It's just the background emission. And uh, we are on a ship uh, passing under the plume in the Strait of Messina, 20, 20 kilometers, as you see, and we encounter the plume of sulfur dioxide at three kilometers height. And we, how can we see that? Well, because we sit on the absorption line and we see off the absorption line of sulfur dioxide. And the curves are the same when there is no sulfur dioxide in the air. But once at three kilometer height, we encounter, they run apart because one wavelength is absorbed more than the other. And that is the trick how we get these range resolves data curves. Of course, in China, there are a lot of uh, challenges in environmental monitoring. So we set up a similar system over there, not a Volvo truck, but some uh, Jiefeng truck here. Jiefeng in Chinese means liberation, <laughs> incidentally. And uh, uh, with this truck and with clever students, we could do similar things when it's not out in the field, we just dock it to the building. Um, can just walk in here and have a very advanced laboratory, uh, like a normal laboratory with all the equipment, uh, you know, so it's not standing idle on a parking lot in the meanwhile. Uh, 
this is from a project in Guizhou. Uh, it's a quite poor province of China, and there is a lot of mining activities over there. Unfortunately, a lot of pollution due to this. And there are the big mercury mines over there. And mercury is mined from Sinovar, HGS. And it's very simple chemistry. You just heat HGS together with O2 oxygen. And out of that comes one SO2 and one HG. It's just heating and the rock sweats out the droplets of mercury. But of course, when that has happened here and we have the tailings, there's still a lot of mercury in. And this is hundreds and thousands of tons of this burnt out ore. And when it's raining, of course, it's seeping out here. And what is this? A rice field. Not a very good combination, as you can see. Uh, we measured in, in the areas of, uh, of uh, Wanshan, meaning 10,000 mountains, by the way, in Chinese. And you can see the range resolved curves out to one kilometer range. It falls off by one over our square dependence, just the elimination law. And the curves are different for on resonance and off resonance. The divided curve slopes, a slope means that there is a concentration and the slope basically maps out the concentration as a functional range. Now 150 nanograms per cubic meter, about a factor of 100 of them, typical background values. So it's quite polluted. An interesting aspect is that you can use such techniques with mercury, not just for environmental monitoring and pollution monitoring. Uh, mercury is also a very interesting geophysical tracer gas because it has a very high vapor pressure and evaporates easily, not quite as water, which of course disappears a drop of water overnight, but a drop of mercury would disappear over a year by fuming. Um, the Terracotta Emperor, Xin Shi Huangdi, who ruled and unified China 2,200 years ago, uh, he built during 40 years his mausoleum with 600,000 people here. Uh, this is the important thing in Xi'an, China. We don't hear so much about that. We more hear about the small army he put in place, 10,000 terracotta soldiers uh, next by. It's in the pits over here, about two kilometers away. But according to the chronicles, the tomb chamber has huge amounts of mercury, uh, hundreds of tons maybe. Uh, mercury was considered to be the elixir of life in those days. It was found out later that he probably died by um, mercury poisoning, by the way, because uh, mercury was supposed to be a very good medicine also in, in those days. But we scanned this uh, pyramid, scanned across here, and we could see the hollow of mercury around, probably coming through small cracks and so on. So this was a quite interesting thing, which we published in scientific reports uh, very, very recently. It's, uh, and our co-authors are people from the world's most famous museum, I would say it almost, the Terracotta Army Museum. So it's a strange combination of uh, uh, interdisciplinary work. Let's leave the atmosphere and go more to pollution in water. You can see that also by inducing fluorescence, like here the Arno River many years ago, actually we had a project down there in Florence. And we can see here the fluorescence spectrum water, very strong bluish fluorescence from all types of detergents and, and dirt in general. And also in the red, a small peak from the algae over a trophicated water. If you instead fire on a tree, you see the chlorophyll very clearly. And the signature of chlorophyll, the ratio between these two peaks, for instance, very much tells you about how much chlorophyll and the status of the tree and so on. So we've been pursuing that a lot. And also monitoring historical buildings. Uh, this is a project we did a lot together with uh, the Institute of Applied Optics in, uh, in Florence, uh, together with the late uh, Anna, uh, uh, Giovanna Cecchi and collaborators. Uh, we had one project at Lund. This is the Lund Cathedral, and you can again see <laughs> the gate I already showed you. 
uh, monitor 60 meters away. Uh, this is from Italy, that is the Parma Cathedral and Baptistry, where you again, by scanning the facades, can see very interesting uh, structures and hotspots of different. Here you can see, for instance, how the algae are growing under this balustrade over here. And here they have fixed this with plastic. It looks beautiful, exactly like the stone. But if you illuminate with ultraviolet light, you really see that these uh, fixings have completely different structures. Colosseum in Rome, another famous place where uh, we scanned uh, the facades and can see interesting thing in these 2000 year old um, stones, uh, travertine stones. And you see the, the bus in place over here. If you focus the laser beam, of course we always operate very eye safe in the UV region, you know, it's uh, relaxed by a factor of thousand outdoor uh, due to the non-transparency of, of the, uh, the, the eye. But if you focus the beam deliberately, it's possible to do breakdown spectroscopy, lips in a distance. And that was demonstrated in Lund first with our system here. We could even show how we could clean statues remotely we could observe at the same time the emission spectrum, the plasma spectrum. We'll hear a lot about star spectra from Henrik Hartmann shortly here. But here is like a little star spectrum also from this hot plasma. And of course, when the emission changes, we can know when to stop the treatment, sort of that. And we have removed everything. The spectra you see below, they are remote spectra, but that's taken with our system actually in China for aluminum and copper. Okay, uh, we can uh, go then to the area of um, uh, agriculture, just few, show a few pictures. I already told you then when you um, induce fluorescence in uh, chlorophyll, you get these typical peaks. And we can again see these peaks here measured remotely. These are from uh, mice, from corn. Uh, this is together with the Henan Agricultural University in Zhengzhou, also a 10 million is, uh, inhabitant city on the Yellow River, actually the cradle of civilization where people were growing, you know, for 5,000 years and so on. So with this system, we can do the remote monitoring of vegetation, Again, of course, together with specialists in this area. It's all interdisciplinary. Of course, I don't know anything about cultural heritage. I don't know anything about pollution. I don't know anything about agriculture. I don't know anything about medicine. But we have our tools and we do the interdisciplinary work. And that's the name of the game to publish together like that. And this is just an example how different varieties of mice different modified rice in China. It looks like the spectra are very similar in fluorescence, as you can see over here, these are fluorescence spectra. These are reflectance spectra, reflectance peaking in green. That's why we think they are green. What we don't see in reflectance is that in the near infrared, all vegetation is like a mirror reflecting almost 100%. That is the typical thing about vegetation seen outside from space, this big edge. But of course, our eye doesn't work there. So we only see this faint little green thing. We say vegetation is green. Well, by multivariate analysis of this, it is possible to, by principal component analysis, really see difference between different things and recognize that. And we also did quite a lot of studies on how the uh, could, could, could check out the um, fertilization by different uh, nitrogen containing compounds. Um, such a big system is a bit awkward, of course. It's basically a way to bring out whatever you can do in the laboratory, bring out anywhere, in this case in China, and do that. We can take samples into the bus and analyze them there, and we can do remote sensing. But of course, this is more convenient. Here we have a drone. Almost all the drones in the world are made in our neighboring city of Shenzhen, close to Hong Kong. It's only one hour uh, away from uh, Guangzhou. 
And here we have such a drone, which can lift up to four kilograms. And our equipment weighted only two and a half kilograms and sitting out there. And what is it? Well, it's a laser transmitting out um, a, a laser beam. And we are imaging along the laser beam from the side of that into a, a multispectral uh, detector. So in one direction, we see the range downwards. And in the other direction, we see uh, the wavelength in fluorescence. So when the drone is flying over the trees outside our laboratories over here, it would hit the crowns first here and give a fluorescence signature, and it will hit the ground uh, below here. And uh, here we see the chlorophyll typical like before. And by doing this with GPS uh, control, we can from all these dots map out the trees and the grass below and see the concentration of chlorophyll uh, over a multispectral three-dimensional image of that by flying this little drone uh, overhead. Quite fun, by the way. Um, here, we have an even simpler system. It's uh, not an imaging system. We just monitor and take the spectrum of the spot. It's a two uh, watt CW laser at 405 nanometer. Or violet, and uh, the water of the Pearl River is uh, shining up here. We take the spectra as we fly over the water, and we see all kinds of pollutants, oils, uh, algae, and so on. And uh, we also put in, uh, uh, you know, dyes, which are used in, uh, in hydrology to see movement of water packages, see how it moves along uh, the water movements and so on. Quite powerful techniques. Uh, laser radar works a lot with scattering, of course, backscattering. And the, the phenomenon of scattering is a very common one. We have it in the atmosphere, of course. This is uh, in our garden here, 100 meters away from where I'm sitting. And of course, on a hazy day, the, there is a hollow around the sun. It's a similar hollow if you shine a laser beam through a slice of apple or through a pharmaceutical tablet, or through my finger. Same physics, but people doing these different things normally go to different conferences and call things different things, but it's all the same, of course, what we are discussing. And this is interesting because, as I said, in LiDAR, you would transmit here and use this scattering with kilometer range. But we also found out that you can, in principle, send out this radiation, you know, much shorter distance like few centimeters into a sample, like in polystyrene foam, which is scattering a lot also, take the light coming back and analyze that light. So this is sort of a um, centimeter scale laser radar. We call this gas in scattering media absorption spectroscopy. And uh, when we do differential absorption LIDAR, like for the mercury I showed before, uh, it would be something like shown in the lower left part of this picture, where we scatter off particles and analyze the gas between the particles. But um, to the right, in the technique we call the gas in scattering media absorption spectroscopy, we instead use the small bubbles um, to scatter. And when the light comes in, we get the sharp imprint of the free gas. Um, the matrix around whatever it is, if it's uh, Swiss cheese or whether it's uh, the lung of a patient or something else, um, well, that could be quite different. And we can see this typically in this case, how we can transmit light through, it passes through the vacuoles, as you can see, and every time it passes the free gas bubble, we get the very sharp imprint, 10,000 sharper times sharper than the bulk medium, which is very slow. Or in this case, in backscattering, this might be a sinus cavity of a patient in this case. And we find these phenomena all over the place where we can uh, use it for fruit, food, wood, uh, packages, pharmaceutical tablets, and so on. Uh, this is the typical broad structures you have in uh, laser medicine, you know, broad absorption structures. 
and we have the area in the middle of the optical window where uh, blood is not absorbing so much and water is not absorbing so much. And if you scan up there, we see at around 760 nanometer, there is an expanded area with the molecular oxygen spectrum. Now it's free molecules and you have all these rotational vibrational lines and they are sharp. If you want to interrogate them, you must hit it on the six digit. It must be a three. It can't be a two, then you are offline. So what we are doing here, based on our experience for environmental monitoring, where the structures are sharp and our 30 year experience in biophotonics, where we have huge scattering and broad structures, combining that you get this project. Because in biomedicine, nobody looked for the sharp structures because there is nothing to look for. It's all solid state physics, but it isn't actually. And that was this lucky coincidence and cross fertilization between two completely different areas. Katharina will talk about the biophotonics, but this is just one example where we send in this radiation into a porous lump. It's like a lump of sugar, if you like, but it's zirconia nanoporous material and it's scattering so much so it looks like it's light travels about five meters before it comes out. So this is of course a long path absorption cell instead of these precision mirrors to make a multipath cell for air pollution monitoring. We use a lump of sugar basically for doing that and use this heavy multiple scattering and see the signatures of the gas which is penetrating in here. And when the pores are small, we can even see how the line shape is distorted by wall collisions instead of intramolecular uh, collisions. So that provides us information on the distribution of pore sizes. A few words about food safety. We discussed agriculture from the agriculture, the food will be coming. So it's all related as you can see. And of course, with this Gaussmas technique, we now have the opportunity to send in the laser light, say, through the headspace, the paper in a, 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 a milk package. It scatters widely in there, and some light reaches the detector. And we can measure the concentration of oxygen in here. In packaging, almost all packaging is all about keeping oxygen out. We have modified atmosphere, nitrogen or carbon dioxide to increase the shelf life and so on. And we have developed this technique quite extensively. But you can ask, how would it be possible to measure the concentration of oxygen? Because of this garbage with scattering, we don't know the path length. And the Bear Lambert law would like to know the path length to get the concentration. Well, the trick is then to at the same time monitor water vapor, which absorbs very close to oxygen because there are water vapor lines everywhere. And we know the concentration of water vapor. It's 100% saturated in the closed enclosure. And we can read up just by the temperature what the concentration is. So now we get the effective path length from water vapor. Insert that for oxygen and we get the concentration of oxygen. There is a spin-off company doing quite a good job here in doing this routinely on conveyor belts, looking at all the packages to see quality control and so on, pharmaceutical industry and so on. All the tablets, you know, are packed in, not in oxygen, not in air and so on. So it's a very important application. Katharina will talk a lot about, uh, you know, the real biophotonics, but this is sort of a bit, it's still living matter. It's the fruit aspects. Uh, you know, 30 or 40% of the they fruits. Are yes. And then um, you can see here how it's possible also with spectroscopy to map out. This is in fluorescence, reflectance, and so on. And it's a case of avocados. Avocados are particularly difficult to judge when they are ripe. You have all cut them open expensive fruit and find that are non-edible and so on. By spectroscopy and a little handheld device, um, you can do this trick and uh, get your green light for doing that. I'll finish off by saying something about ecology. You know, if you can see big particles in the air, 
uh, of course, uh, small particles, pollutants, you can also see the bigger ones, which are the uh, insects, as we can see here. And um, you can uh, hit them with a laser beam. And we started with pulse lasers. This is our version of uh, the Riga satellite ranging. <laughs> we range the little satellite out there and image it. You see the eco 80 meters away. It's not 80 kilometers or 800 kilometers, but you see the fluorescence eco in different colors so we can identify it. But it's possible to do it even simpler with a CW system and just observe the laser beam at a slant angle, uh, tilt the detector, and in that way, get sharp imaging all the way. It's called the Sheen fluke arrangement. And this is an example from studies in, in China where we do that. So it's a CW, very cheap ra laser radar system, where we on the screen can see every time an insect flies into the laser beam, there is a small blip like this. It's like sitting on a movie. During one night, you get 100,000 hits of insects. This is the termination, half a kilometer away, as you can see over here. If you expand one of these and read out the detector really fast, you can see there is an oscillation. So there is an oscillation, and these are the wing beats, which is, of course, a fingerprint for them. Some have the high pitch, some have low pitch. Even more, they don't move the wings in a sinusoidal way, but there are overtones, as you can see here overtones, harmonics. So this is my aspect of harmonics. From uh, Dr. Garnier, we will hear a lot about high harmonics. We use the same Fourier transforms and so on to, uh, to see them. And it's interesting to follow over a day from morning to night, uh, how the number of insects are there and what type of insects, because you can do the statistics of wing beat frequencies uh, and you see it's quite different. This can also be done underwater. Uh, we have demonstrated that in uh, two papers. Of course, the ranges are much shorter. We can even see uh, the wagging of the tails of the fish and the moving of the legs of the shrimps and so on. And uh, it's quite interesting also by fluorescence by uh, this multispectral range resolved uh, setup. Coming to the end, I just would like to say that uh, the nice thing is that many of these techniques are so cheap and realistic, so even the poorest countries can adopt them. And we worked actually from the Lund uh, set up here for 20 years or so, try to help on a small scale in Africa. We have different projects there, taking people in locally to Lund or arranging workshops at different places. And uh, a lot of these simple-minded, say, in fluorescence or gosmos or uh, LIDAR uh, are available at, in the most incredible places, like in Bamako in Mali on the Niger River. And, uh, you know, Mali, uh, this country is with this plagued by malaria. You can also do uh, this multispectral imaging of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, blood smears by multispectral imaging, variety of uh, uh, light emitting diodes and do the spectroscopy on the illumination side instead of the detection side. On the illumination side, it becomes free of charge because the LEDs, they cost uh, a dollar each. Uh, and uh, we just use the black and white camera and multivariate analysis. So even in quite some range, we can do this work. And this is available at many places. So that's a nice thing. Uh, so I hope I could uh, convince you that uh, the applied laser spectroscopy is quite powerful. It's uh, really possible to apply it in many areas. And our hope is that together with all scientists in basic and applied fields to try to make the blue planet a bit better for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much uh, for your great, great uh, story about your various and multidisciplinary research and cooperation, especially with uh, with China and with other colleagues around. Really, we can learn a lot. <clears throat> My suggestion is that we 
We are not asking questions now, but we will go through all three uh, reports. And afterwards, we can uh, make the question session on 